Spark PG Revision Course. I am Dr. Satish Kumar, Assistant Professor of Neurology. This is Dr. Javed. I am here to demonstrate a basic neurological examination needed for a psychiatric postgraduate. To begin with the cranial nerves, I will start with the olfactory nerve. Now I am going to demonstrate to you how to examine the olfactory nerve. In olfactory nerve, you have to test each nostril separately and for that you can use a common substances like coffee and aspodita and you put it in a small container blinded uh, so that the patient doesn't see what is the container, uh, what is in the container. You have to demonstrate the smell and if he tells if he perceives the smell, that is enough. He may, he may not even say what substance it is. Now can you close your eyes? Can you close one nostril? Are you able to feel this? Yes sir. What is the smell? Coffee. Sir. So it is enough that if he tells that he is able to perceive the smell, not necessary to name the object also. And uh, you can repeat this with the other nostril also. Now, the examination of the second nerve, which includes visual acuity, visual field examination, the pupillary light reaction, the fundus examination, and a color vision examination. So, for that purpose, it is difficult to uh, arrange a Snellens chart in a neurology clinics where you need at least a minimum of 10 feet. So, instead of that, we test here a near vision by using a modified Rosenbaum chart, which is held at a distance of the 14 inch, and the patient is asked to read the numbers. If he is not able to read the numbers, you can use a pin hole and then mention that after testing with the pin hole, how much he has improved. How much after testing with pin hole, how much vision has improved. Now, can you close your one of your eyes? Now, I am asking him to hold it at a distance of 14 minutes and ask him to read the numbers, whether he is able to read up. Can you start reading from the first line? Yes, sir. 95, 95, 3925428365324258637626 Yes, he is able to read all the numbers correctly and you can mention the what is the visual equity given in the side of the Rosenbaum chart. Next, we are going to examine this color vision. For that, you need a Ishihara plate either in the electronic form or in the book form. Uh, I have electronic form here. Now this is the Ishihara chart where there are the numbers are hidden under a colored background so you can see here the number is in a different color and the background is in a different color so the subject has to identify what are the numbers hidden in these plates let us test his color vision now now there you should tell what is the number behind this 29 29 8 12 yes he is able to tell the numbers correctly so, the best thing to examine a color vision is to use a Ishihara chart. So, in case uh, if the subject has a refractive error, test with the best possible correction. That is test with spectacles on. And in case if you are not allowed to bring any electronic media to the exam hall, you can take a printout of the Ishihara charts and compile it in a book. Next, we will be examining the pupillary reaction or a light reaction. For that, you need a torch and you can ask him to see straight and you should check for a pupillary reaction. I am able to see the pupillary reaction here. Able to see here. So, bring it from sidewards. Okay, I am able to see the response and simultaneously, you should also see the response on the other side 
where there will be a pupillary contraction which is called as a consensual reflex. Next will be the fundus examination. So, regarding fundus examination, uh, neurologically, neurology, we have to examine with the help of a direct ophthalmoscope, which is a handheld ophthalmoscope. We can look directly to the fundus of the patient to know about the disc margins as well as the retina, which are is visible, and also in the macula. So, for that, ask the patient to look straight. You can look straight, and you can start focusing on this right fundus with the help of the right hand. I am able to see the disc. For the left fundus, use your left hand. You can examine the fundus. The disc margins are clear. For refractive error, you have a correction given in the ophthalmoscope and you have to adjust this wheel accordingly. Next will be Next will be the examination of the visual field. For that, you need a 1 meter distance between the subject and examiner seated at the same level. So, this is a visual field examination, a confrontation method where you have to close one eye of the patient as well as diametrically opposite eye of the examiner and you have to divide this visual field into four halves this is supranasal, infranasal, supratemporal, infratemporal. You have to examine in the four quadrants. You have to divide it into four quadrants and you have to examine in all the four quadrants. And there are two ways of doing in this examination. You can wiggle your finger at a static place or you can bring it down outward from the field to inward. So, you can do it either way. I will show you the static method first. First, you have to close your eyes. A diametrically opposite eye should be closed here. So, we are comparing the field of the examiner and the subject. So, I am dividing into four quadrants here. So, first, I will show you the static method. Javed, can you see my finger wiggling? Yes. Sir. The patient should look only in the examiner's eyes. Can you see the finger yes, wiggling? Can you see the finger wiggling? Yes, sir. Can you see the finger wiggling? Yes, sir. Can you see the finger wiggling? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So all quadrants I have tested. Uh, patient is able to see my wiggling finger. Other technique is you can bring from outward to the inward. So I will demonstrate that. Now can you close the right hand? Just diametrically opposite you close. Now you have to tell me when my finger is visible. So now I am going to examine the ocular motor system which consists of a third nerve, fourth nerve and sixth nerve namely ocular motor nerve, uh, trochlear nerve and abdicin nerve. To begin with, I am going to examine this extraocular moments in nine cardinal directions and this is the primary question which he looks out and next can you follow the finger, okay, look here. So his medial rectus, right medial rectus as well as the left lateral rectus is working. Like that, you have to examine upward direction, downward direction, downward here, upward here in the corner, in the corner, lateral, left downward. Is able to see my finger downward corner, and he is able to follow my finger. The extraocular movements are full. This is how the extraocular movements are examined. Next will be the accommodation reflex, where you can. Ask the patient to subject to focus on a distant object and immediately focus on the nearby object. Jal, can you see the distant object? Yes. Now you have to see immediately this red tipped object. See the distance? See here? See there? Mm -hmm. Yes. I can see the medial red tip converging, so that is convergence and accommodation to place The next will be the 
uh, testing for a circuit and a pursuit and then nystagmus. So if there is any nystagmus, you can mention which direction it is and where it is leading. If the first component direction is the same as the direction of the nystagmus. So to begin with, I will test the circuit. So regarding the testing circuit, I have to come diametrically opposite to him. I have to come directly opposite to him. Now Jarrod, you have to look at the root of my nose and you have to point this finger whenever you strike that. Now look here, look there, look here, alternatively quickly, quickly, yes, he is able to immediately take the target off on and off. So his circuits are normal. Now I am going to test the smooth pursuit where he has to track my finger. So track this finger, track this finger, track this finger, yes, he is able to follow smoothly. Move, make the movement very slow because you are testing smooth pursuit. You can go vertically also, you can follow this. He is able to follow the fingers. Next we will be examining the trigeminal law where there is a sensory component, motor component and reflexes. We have a superficial reflex and a deep reflex. Regarding the sensory component, you can touch the uh, sensation of the face with the help of this of a cotton. For uh, pain temperature, you use a wooden stick. I am going to test the trigeminal nerve sensation in three divisions. Phi 1, Phi 2, Phi 3. Phi 1 will be the ophthalmic branch, Phi 2 will be the maxillary branch, Phi 3 will be the mandibular branch. Now, Jarrod, can you close your eyes? Are you able to feel the touch of the cotton? Yes, sir. Here? Yes, sir. Here? Yes, sir. Here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes. he's able to feel the touch of the cotton. Now I'm going to test the pin temperature. Can you close your eyes? Are you able to feel the pin prick? Yes, sir. Are you able to feel? Yes, sir. Are you able to feel equally? Yes, sir. Yes, he's able to feel equally. Yes, sir. It's the print print. Next, I'm going to examine the motor system. Where I will ask him to cleanse his teeth. Can you cleanse your teeth? Yes, I can feel the masita bulb. Can you relax? Cleanse your teeth? Yes. I am testing masita bulb is adequate, good, good enough for contracting. And next, I will be testing the cardiac reflex so that you can use a wisp of water and bring it from sideways. Can you do your and bring it from sideways to touch the cardiac and not directly into the eyes to avoid the menace reflex. So I'm taking a wisp of cotton. Taking a wisp of cotton where I have to touch this cornea gently in order to evoke a blink reflex, which is a normal reflex. Can you see straight? So I'm going to touch this cornea. This is a closure of it. This is the blink reflex. This is the cornea, normal cornea reflex where the patient will close his eyes immediately upon touching the cornea with the wisp of cotton. This then tells that the Sensation is intact in the cornea. This is one of the superficial reflex which we will test. And deep reflex, we use a knee hammer, a knee square hammer I am using now. We have to ask the patient to open his jaw a little slightly and then strike on the jaw with the help of the hammer. I will show you how. Now can you open your mouth a little? Now this is enough. Just strike the hammer on your thumb. So there will be a closure of the mouth. If there is an excessive closure, charge up is exaggerated. If there is no closure or if there is a mild closure, you can tell it is normal or absent. Charge can be absent even in normal visuals. Regarding the testing of the facial now, we have a two components, a motor and a special sensory which is involving the taste. So for taste you have to use four substances, it is a sugar solution, salt solution and for soreness use a citric acid that is a lemon juice and for bitter taste use a vinegar. And test in the anterior two thirds of the tongue and not in the tips and you have to rinse between each testing. First I will ask him to close his eyes and just, I should not see the test samples. In order to test the taste sensation, 
you have to use that damn wooden applicator in four solutions. You have to dip it and keep it in the patient's tongue and ask him to tell what taste it is. Now, Jaya, can you close your eyes now and dip it in the taste solution, which the patient sh should not see what it is. And can you protrude your tongue nicely? Now, are you able to feel the taste sensation? What taste it is? Sure. Sure. Yes. And after you have to rinse again and test with the bitter. Bitter should be tested at the last because of the aftertaste sensation. So you can test for next for soreness, next for salt, and finally go for a bitter. Repeat this test on either side of the tongue. So what does signify taste sensation is in a peripheral nerve palsy, facial palsy, a loss of taste sensation tells that the lesion is proximal to style mustard parana. So that is the significance of testing taste. And coming to the Coming to the motor portion, I have to examine the facial muscles. So, how to examine the facial muscles? First, I will ask the patient to instruct. Uh, can you repeat the forehead? Yes, this is the frontalis contraction. Can you say E? You can examine the nasolabial fold, which is symmetric, that is very, very important. And can you blow your cheeks? So, you can examine here. He is able to hold the hand intact. Can you close your eyes tight shut and try to open? Thank you. So, here the facial muscles are intact and normal. And regarding the uh, eighth nerve or the vestibular cochlear nerve, usually test only the cochlear portion. For that, you have to do a screening test initially for hearing. Puton autometry is the ideal method, but for screening purpose, you can use a ticking sound of a watch or you can use a fingers scratching. Can you close your eyes? Are you able to hear the sound? Yes. Are you able to hear? Yes. Yes is able to hear on both sides. This is a screening for hearing. And in order, in order to differentiate between a conductive hearing loss and sensory hearing loss, we have two tests. One is Rini test, another one is Weber test. For that, you need a Pi-12 Hertz tuning board. This is a Pi-12 Hertz tuning board. And for Rini test, there are two methods of doing. I will show you what it is. First, I will strike the times, strike the times, and keep it in the mastoid, and keep it immediately in the ear. And I will ask him, where you are hearing louder, either in the air or in the ears. Ear. In the ear, he is hearing. In the ear, he heard loudly. In the master, little bit less louder compared to air conduction. So that is because normally air conduction will be better than bone conduction. So that is the norm. If the patient says bone conduction is louder compared to air conduction, then it means that he has conductive hearing loss. Now the other method of doing traditional, though that is more traditional method is. So keep that, strike the times, strike the times, vibrate it and keep it in the mastoid and after the dampening of the sound, you keep it in the ear and ask the patient whether he can still hear it. A normal patient will still hear even after the hearing is stopped in mastoid. If it doesn't hear, then his bone conduction is better than air conduction which may say is again that it is a conductive hearing loss. Then the Weber test also differentiates between sensory neural hearing loss and a conductive hearing loss. I will strike the uh, tuning fork and keep it in the midline and even ask him which ear he hears better. In case of conductive hearing loss, the affected ear will hear best. In case of sensory neural hearing loss, the normal ear will hear best. Can you hear on both sides equally? Yes, sir. Can you keep it in the fork or a vertex? Can you hear both sides equally? Yes, sir. Yes, he can hear on both sides equally. So this is how Weber test is done.
9 and 10th term are just at both together. It's a class of residential vegan now. For that, you have to look at the portion of the ula and also ask the patient to say ah and finally test the gag reflex. For that, ask the patient to open his mouth. Can you open your mouth? Ah. Now ula is in midline. Can you say ah? Ah. Both the palate are moving equally. Ah. Can you say ah? Ah. Can you say ah? Ah. Yes. Now, I am going to touch this. Pharyngeal pillars to evoke the gag reflex. Be gentle, try to be gentle in testing the pharyngeal reflex. Can you open your mouth? I am going to touch then gently. So, there is an immediate gag response which involves a vomiting sensation or contraction of the pharyngeal muscles you can see. Next we are going to examine the spinal axillary nerve which uh, innervates both sternomastoids and trapezius. So first we have to examine the sternomastoid, ask the patient to look in the opposite direction and give some resistance. Can you look in the left side? You can examine, you can feel the bulk and the palpation, you can feel the contracting muscle, you can sit in the opposite direction, you can feel the sternomastoid here and you can test both the sternomastoid by bending forward. Can you bend forward? Yes, bend forward, give some resistance here. You can test both the sternum and sternum. Now, regarding the trapezius, you have to ask the patient to strike the shoulder by giving some resistance. Can you strike your shoulder? Yes. He is able to do it normally. Finally, the examination of the 12th nerve, the last cranial nerve. For that, 12th nerve innervates the tongue where you have to look at the position of the tongue and also the any involuntary movements like fasciculations and you can also see for any wasting or activity. Now, can you show your tongue? See, the tongue is midline. There is no wasting, no furrowing, there is no deviation. If there is a hypoglossal nerve injury, the deviation will be to the same side. And to look for fasciculations, it's a sign of a motor neuron disease or an ALS. You have to ask the patient to place the tongue inside the mouth and look for fasciculations. Now, can you open your mouth and don't protrude your tongue? So now you can see the tongue at rest. There is no fasciculations. The tongue is normal. There is no involuntary twitchings, which, which is seen as fasciculations. This concludes the examination of the cranial nerve. Then we are going to see the motor system examination.